All right. Okay. Now I'm on. Praise the Lord. Yeah, uh, the other day was uh, <clears throat> my wife had gotten this, um, this article, which she doesn't have. She lost it, but she told me about it anyway. And I thought it was really cool. Um, well, actually, this lady was in a shopping center or a, a grocery store. And this man comes up and taps her on the shoulder and he says, you know, uh, he says, I have no money and uh, I'm hungry. Would you buy these two cans of food for me? And so she looks at him and she says, okay. She goes, meet me up at the register. I got a couple more things to pick up and I'll meet you up there. And the man turns to her and says, you know something, lady? She goes, you are the first one that actually did something, that actually said yes. Everybody I've been asking today, and I've been asking a lot of people, have been just rejecting me. They haven't been letting me, they, 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 didn't, they didn't want to buy me anything. They'd either ignore them or they would just, you know, tell them to go away or they didn't have any money or whatever the case was, but nobody wanted to help them. And so he said, and you're the first one that said yes, and so I just want to give you, uh, you know, thank you for your, for your heart, and I wanted, all I wanted to do today was bless somebody. And so he said, I don't need the money. He said, here's an envelope with $1,000. Handed her a $1,000. True story. This is, this is, this, it's, that, that's a true story. And, you know, I was thinking about that, and I was saying, boy, you know, God, so many people reject you. So many people reject the little things that you always have for them. You know, like when we go out there and, and we see that person on the side of the road and we have some jumper cables in the back of our trucks, but we don't want to pull over and help them or, or jumpstart somebody's car. Or if it's, you know, it, unless there's something that's in it for us, we don't want it. But yes, this guy going around is a blessing. You know, all those other people, guess what? They rejected $1,000. But I guarantee if they knew it was $1,000, they would have accepted it real quick. But the interesting thing is they don't accept trying to help somebody in need because they don't see any value in it for themselves, and that's where they're wrong. There is so much value in when you're helping other people. When you get that mentality of what would Jesus do, I know that's like a 90s thing that, that, they, that they were pushing years ago. You know, what would Jesus do? But that's so true. What would Jesus do? If you get that mentality, you'll be saying yes to a lot more things and, a lot, and no to a lot of other things. And when you do that, guess what? God leads you into a plan. And so these people rejected him, and I thought about that, and I said, you know, there's a lot of rejection that goes out in the, in the, in the world. And so the title of my message this morning is Rejecting God's Plan for You. And my uh, verse, my, I'm sorry, my uh, key verse this morning, my key verse, where to go? Hallelujah. Okay. All right. There it is. My key verse this morning. There is a judge for those who reject me and do not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn them at the last day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, God wants to get you from where you are to where God wants you to be. That's our motto here. But how can God get you to where you're supposed to be if you keep rejecting everything? And that's what we're going to focus on today is rejection. Not a good thing to focus on, but that's what we're going to do today. God has a plan for you. How many of you know that? God has a plan for you. God has a plan for you. He has a plan for me. He's trying to daily to change your heart. He starts with the little things, like helping someone in need, as we were just telling with the person in the grocery store. The man needed a little help. You know, what was it, maybe four or five bucks? But nope, nobody wanted to help him because there was nothing in it for them, so they rejected him. You think that it doesn't profit you, but it does. Uh, it's how God tests the heart so that he can lead us into his plan for us. You know, when... If you were to, I was thinking about this the other day, just like it just came to me. I was like, you know, if we said yes to everything God told us to do, if you said yes to what you're supposed to do, because we know, we know what we're supposed to do. We know what we're not supposed to do. We feel it, you know, especially, you know, as Christians I'm talking about now, as Christians, we know when we should do something and when we shouldn't do something. But yet if you said yes to everything you were supposed to do, do you know that you would be in God's plan? You would be preaching in stadiums. You would probably be around the world uh, evangelizing. I mean, there would be so many things God would have you in. He would have you, whatever your talents are, whatever your strengths are, he would multiply them tenfold because he knows he can trust you because he trusts you in the little things so of course he's going to trust you in the big things hallelujah hallelujah 
So God has a plan for you. But today, I want to talk about a plan God has for a king, one of many kings of Israel. Now, I know that, I think it was uh, several weeks ago, well, actually, I like the book of Kings, as you can tell, because a couple of weeks ago, we were, pre- we were preaching on, on Kings. She was preaching on Joash. I was preaching on, on uh, Solomon and uh, Josiah. I mean, uh, Adonijah, Adonijah. Kings, ha- the thing I love about Kings so much is that we can learn so much from these people because of the mistakes that they made and their successes that they made. And so when, you, when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, he tells us that these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of ages has come. In other words, we can learn from what they did back then and help us today and not make the same mistakes that they made. And so I like the book because it teaches us how God works with us, especially with kings, because kings are accountable to God. We're all accountable to God, but not like kings were. Kings, you know, whatever they did affected their nations. And so God was very, you know, specific on what the kings had to do in their nations. And so when you look at those, those are the best ones to look about and look at because even though they were kings then, we're kings today. Today we're kings. We're all kings of the Lord. But I wanted, I, that's why I want to focus on them. I spoke on uh, I, uh, King Solomon and Adonijah holding on to the wrong things. And uh, Pastor Damaris, after, had spoke on King Joash and did not strike the arrow with victory, if you remember that. He didn't strike it. He struck the ground only three times, and he won the three battles. But if he would have struck it five times, he would have actually gone out and beat the war. It's one thing to win the battle, but we want to win the war. So I want to talk about this man who had an opportunity of a lifetime and how he handled it. But, if I, but before I do this, I just want to put this into context and I want to kind of set the stage of what happened. You see, Solomon was the very last king for the united Israel. And Israel, because of his sin and what he did, because of his wives, he's had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And what he did is because of his wives, he would bring in some idols for some of them to worship. And what happened is it got out of hand and Israel started worshiping these idols as well. It wasn't his intention, but that's what was happening. And God was very angry with uh, Solomon because his heart was turning away from the Lord. It's, he, he, was, he was not totally committed. He was not totally committed. He still loved the Lord and everything, but he wasn't totally committed to him anymore. And so because of this, God was going to take, or God did take, the uh, kingdom from him. But he didn't take it from Solomon personally. He took it from his son. He was going to let Solomon run his reign because he promised his servant David that he would. So he ran his reign, but God had had enough, and he was going to take the kingdom away from him. And that's when our first, that's when the split of uh, the two regions actually happened. You have a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. This region was split into two. And God took the northern region, which is the ten tribes of Israel, and gave them to a man named Jeroboam. He took the other two uh, tribes, the southern region, known as the southern kingdom, and he let Solomon's son, who came into reign after Solomon had passed away, when he came into power, he gave him the other two tribes that were left. Because of the tribe of Judah, he wanted to extend that before the Lord. You know, the Lord wanted to, for his servant David. Remember, uh, David is a, uh, is a, um, like a type and shadow of Christ and Jerusalem. And so he wanted to make sure that that would, that legacy would go on. So his son did get that, but the rest of it was torn away from him and given to this other man, Jeroboam. And the man that, and Solomon's son's name was uh, uh, Rehoboam. Not brothers, although the name sounds very familiar, but they're not. Two different, two different uh, people. I mean, two different uh, moms, and you know, not, they're, not, they're not related. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so God takes, makes Jeroboam king of the northern kingdom. And now what I'm going to talk to you about this morning is Jeroboam's story, how he came into power and what he did uh, when God called him. Hallelujah. All right. Praise God. And so now let's start with Jeroboam's story. Jeroboam was from the tribe of Ephraim, and he was a servant of King Solomon. Now, 
Jeroboam was a man of good standing. This guy was a, he was a, he was a good guy, like he had good character, you know, he was probably good looking, you know, he, he was uh, smart, he was witty, you know, he had, uh, you know, he had a lot of charisma and stuff like that. And so Solomon noticed that about him and he was, he had good leadership qualities and he said, you know, this guy, Jeroboam, he, he really knows his stuff. I, I like this guy a lot. And so he takes him and he says, you know what, I'm going to put you in charge of my workforce. So he puts him in charge of the whole labor force that Solomon has, which was pretty big. And it was the, uh, tribe, the, the tribes of Joseph. So he puts him in charge of his labor force and uh, he gets his, his new position. And so one day, Jerob, uh, Jeroboam is going for, you know, he's, 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 coming out of, um, he's coming out of Jerusalem. And on his way on the road, he meets up with a guy named Ahijah. Now, Ahijah is a prophet from Shiloh. And so when, uh, Jehijah, when the prophet, it's easier to say the prophet, when the prophet comes up to, to Jeroboam, he says he needs to speak to him. You know, he kind of runs into him. So they go off alone somewhere. So right away, you know that there's something that this guy, this prophet wants to tell him. Now, I'm sure that Jeroboam knew he was a prophet and said, well, if this man wants to talk to me, then this is something coming from God and I need to hear it. And so they get off to the side, and this guy, uh, this, this prophet comes up to him with wearing this brand new cloak that he had just worn, that he had just, uh, that he had just got. As a matter of fact, where did my cloak go? Oh, here it is. Yeah. So he's got this new, he has this cloak. Okay. Something like this, only it was square. So he's showing up with this brand new, this brand new cloak that he's wearing. Now I say brand new because that's very significant because the Bible mentions it twice. He's wearing this cloak and then he took his cloak. And so this new cloak. And the reason why he's saying it's new is because God is about to do something new. And so he, he's, he's got this cloak, he meets up with this, he meets up with Jeroboam and he takes off his cloak and he starts to tear it into 12 pieces. Now it's, he's looking at this guy and he must be thinking to himself, you know, Either this guy is crazy or he really has something for me from the Lord because he's standing in front of me, taking his clothes off and ripping them into 12 pieces. I don't kind of get what that's all about. And so as he rips these things into 12 pieces, he turns to Jeroboam and he gives him, he tells him to take 10 pieces. So Jeroboam goes to take 10 pieces. And then he says this. He says, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. Now, this is exciting. I'm... I'm, I'm I can't, I can't help that, you know, this, this, this is real exciting what I'm about to tell you right now. Oh, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. God is so good. Amen. <laughs> praise God. And so he looks at him and he says this, he says, he says, take 10 pieces for yourself. God's about to give him a plan. God is about to give Jeroboam a plan. He's about to give him the plan for his life right now. And the thing is, is that if I was Jeroboam, I would be so excited right now because what he's about to do is he's going to give something new. He's wearing a new cloak. He understands that. He knows what he's doing. He's going to hand him this. He's going to hand. He just took 10 pieces of something. He doesn't know what he took yet, but he knows that it's something that God has given him. You know, God is ready to give him a plan. God is ready to give you guys a plan for your life. God has a plan, a unique and custom tailored plan, one that fits you and is designed for you. Perfect. And the, from before the foundations of the world that belongs to you and if you want victory if you want the peace if you want the joy if you want the love then reach out and grab it take it by force and hold on to it never let go it's eternal and as many crowns are attached to it God has a plan for you God has a plan for him God has a plan for you too and that's what I want to show you right here because this plan that he's about to show that I'm about to tell you about is going to be is going to be a blueprint for what we have today and so I, I want to, that's why I, I'm not sure how to jump into this because this is so exciting and I, wa I want to give it its due. I really want to show you how exciting this actually is. Oh, praise the Lord. So I'm going to read to you what he's telling, what he's telling uh, Jerome, uh, Jeroboam. And this is in uh, 1 Kings 11, 35 through 37 is where you'll find the scripture. And he says this, he says, I will take the kingdom from, from I will take the kingdom from his son, his son's hands, and give you 10 tribes. He says, I will take the kingdom from his, that means Solomon's, that means Solomon, that's what he's talking about, Solomon's son. 
That's what he said. That's why with this is, when this was, at this particular time in this man's life, Solomon was still alive. So this hasn't happened yet. This is a prophecy, and he's telling him that he's going to give him ten tribes, and he's going to take it from Solomon's son, which is Rehoboam. He's going to take it from him, and he's going to give it to Jeroboam, okay? He's going to give him ten tribes. And listen to this. He says, however... However, this is the part I love the best. However, however, let me tell you something. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm a, I'm a however. I'm a however. I'm a however. Let me tell you, however, he says, for as for you, I will take you and you will rule over all that your heart desires. Hallelujah. He's going to take him. He's going to anoint him. He's going to rule over all his desires. That's what God's going to do for us. He's going to rule over your heart's desire. He's going to let you rule over any, all your heart desires. We have desires in our heart, and there's things that we want to rule over, and God's going to give it to you. He's going to give it to Jeroboam, and he's giving it to us today. You can even put your name. As a matter of fact, you know, it, 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 listen to me carefully now. This is not just for Jeroboam. This is for us. This is for today. You see, in fact, if you put your name in verse 37, you can put your name in verse 37, and you can sit there, you can say that this is what the Lord God of Israel says to Dan. Dan, you will rule over all your heart desires. Alan, you're going to rule over all your heart desires you're going to rule over all your heart desires. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I'm going to give you rule over all of your heart desires. And he doesn't stop there. He goes on and he says, you will be king over Israel. And he says, as my servant David, and I will be with you and I will build you a dynasty as, in, as a destiny, a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David and will give Israel to you. Now, this is exciting because this here is a blueprint of what God is doing for us today. This isn't just for Jeroboam. This is for us today. Now, when Jeroboam was in during his time, this is, I mean, he's a king. This guy's he's making him a king over this whole northern territory. He's getting his prayers answered. If this is what he wants, he wants power. He wants victory. He wants peace. He wants all of it. God's giving it to him. And Jesus gives it to us. He gives it to us today. And how does he do it? Just like this. He does the same thing. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over that in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So he tells him he's going to do all of these different things for him. And he says he's gonna be, he's, that he's going to rule over all his heart desires. He's going to be king, king over all of Israel. He's going to have, he's going he's gonna to be with him. As a matter of fact, if you look at what he's doing, look at the things that he's doing. What I see in here, I see seven different things that God has given him that God is going to give us today. He's given him 10 tribes. He's given him power. He says, however, as for you, I will take you. In other words, he's going to anoint you. You will be king over Israel. He, that's, a, that's, that's privilege. You'll rule over all your heart desires. That's authority. He says, I will be with you. That's his protection. He says, I will give you a, Dennis, a dynasty. A, a, a dynasty enduring as the one I built for David. That's legacy. And he says, I'll give Israel to you, and, and that's an inheritance. You see what he's saying, what God is saying here? He's saying that he's going to give him a legacy like David's, and he told him that he's going to keep it. Now, I want to make this clear. He said that he's going to give him Israel, and if he abides on what God tells him to do, he's going to continue in this, in this legacy. He's going to have a legacy just like David. This is what he's going to have. This is what, this is what he's going to have. This is what he's given him, and this is what he's going to have. And he's ex he should be excited about this. And we need to be excited about this because this is what God is saying. And I'm, say and I'm making an emphasis on this, as you'll see, we're, we're going through this. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so now he promises to him that he's going to be able to do all, this thing, all of these different things. He's going to be all of this ruler and all of this kind of stuff and everything. And then he says to him, if, if, that's the big word right there, if. I will give you all of this if. I will have you rule over the desires of your heart if. I will give you, make you king over Israel if. I will help you defeat the enemy that you guys are going through right now if. I will give you every prayer that your heart is asking for if. You see, if. There's an if here. There's an if. It's not a big if, but it all depends on how you look at it. It's not a lot, but it's an if. And so what is that if? Well, in verse 38, it says, if. You do whatever I command you and walk in obedience to me and do what is right in my eyes, obeying my decrees and commands, then he will do that. If, if you do whatever I command, if you walk in obedience to me, 
If you do what is right in my eyes, if you obey my decrees and my commands, my laws. And that's the same thing over here. Jesus tells us the same thing. If he gives you, he will answer your prayers. He will give you what you ask for if you love Jesus and follow his commands. He says that in, uh, he says that in John 14, 14 through 15. He says, ask me anything and I will give it to you if you love me and keep my commands. So we follow that all through when God gives the promises, if. He, he mentions that, and it's important. Why does he mention that? You know, I, I look at people sometimes when they come up with these, you know, all kinds of craziness that goes on out in the world today. And I think about that, and they say, oh, you know, it's not working for me. God's not answering my prayer, or he's not doing this, or he's not doing that. Well, what are you doing? Are you taking care of the if in your life? Are you fixing whatever ifs you might have? Are you following Jesus the way you are? you following his commands? Are you loving Jesus the way he needs to be loved? Are you, are you doing these things? Or, or maybe you're missing it somewhere. Maybe you're not doing the things that God wants you to do, the things that ifs, that if. If that if isn't being done, if that if isn't being worked out, then God's not going to be able to him because you're making him powerless. And so if is a very important thing, and a lot of people fail or fall because of if. A lot of people walk away from the Lord because of if. They just can't do the if. And the if is not hard to do. But if God created everything, and we know he did, then God's in charge of everything, then that means God must have the instructions about everything. And so if we go by God's instructions and we do what his instructions tell us to do, then we can't fail. If you build a computer and you're a computer builder and you go and give it to somebody else and you say, okay, I need you to do this and it's going to do that, that, and the other thing and all of these bells and whistles and everything and then the guy takes it and he says, oh, you know what? No, no, I'm, I'm going to do it this way. It, it ain't going to work. It's going to break, right? And so it's, it's the same thing with God's word. If God tells you a certain way to do it, if he tells you to do something and you don't do it and you do it on your own accord and what you feel is doing, you want to make God laugh sometime? Tell him your plans. <laughs> God will laugh because he knows the instructions. And it's so funny how God says, God told me to do this. Did you do it? Well, well, well not yet. I haven't had enough time. Yeah. If God told you to do it, if God is giving you the instructions, if he's telling you how to do things, then you can do them. You can do them, but you got to follow him. And so God created everything. Hallelujah. So if this is God's plan for us, then as long as we follow his instructions, then we should be, we should be okay. Everything is going to go according to plan. It's like an architect when he, when he has a blueprint and he doesn't follow it correctly. The builder doesn't follow it correctly. He, builds this, he, he, he lays out this beautiful house and then he says, okay, and he gives it to the builder and the builder's like, oh, wait a minute, I, I can't do that. No, that's not right. I'm going to do it this way. And, uh, oh, I'm going to change that. And I, no, no, he's wrong. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And he writes it. And then the house falls down. Nobody's going to let a, a, a builder change an architectural plans without the architect knowing about it. And that's the same thing. God's our architect. And we need to recognize that his plans are for a reason, and we need to follow them. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So what happened to Jeroboam? Did he do that? Did Jeroboam follow God's instructions? Did he pass the big if? What did Jeroboam do? Hmm. Evidently, he didn't get the memo. Because Jeroboam did not do, the th as a matter of fact, he did everything the opposite. He followed, well, let me, let me tell his story, because this is his story. Hallelujah, praise God. Praise the Lord. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Jeroboam is now the king of Israel, the king of Israel. He has the whole northern king. He's got the ten tribes and everything. And uh, some time goes by. He builds up Sachem. He goes and builds up Peniel. So some time has been going by. But he, noticed, he starts to notice something. He notices that... The people of Israel, the, you know, his people that are there, that he's in his kingdom, are going to Jerusalem. They're going to Jerusalem because that's where the tabernacle is and, and that's where they go to worship God. You have to go, God put his name there and at that time you had to go where God's name was put and so you went there. You didn't worship any form or anything like that, you know, like Moses said when you heard God speaking out of the mountains and out of the fire, right? He, he told, he point blank told him, he said, you didn't see no form, did you? You heard his voice. You heard his thunder, but you didn't see a form, did you? That's why we don't have to, that's why we don't build idols and make images of God. That's why he's the only God that we serve. We don't make and bow down to anything else. And that's why Jeroboam, uh, that's why uh, Solomon was losing his 
part of the kingdom because of just that. And so now Jeroboam, who just got all of his wonderful instructions and his wonderful prophecy, goes back and sees these people are going to Jerusalem to worship God, and he says, you know what? He goes, this isn't going to work. He starts getting scared. He's thinking, like, if these guys keep doing that, they're just going to eventually reunite. He's, in in, in tw verse 26, Jeroboam, Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to their lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah, that's Solomon's son. He says, and they will kill me and return back to King Jer uh, uh, Rehoboam. Now, that's why I made a big deal about if God says that this is what you're going to get, why is he all of a sudden worried that they're all going to be reunited? Which isn't a bad thing anyway, right? We want, we, we want Israel and, uh, to come back together. They never did get back to, together again after that. They won't until, the, until Jesus comes again. But the thing is, is that he was told what he was going to get. And yet he went back on that and decided he was going to do it his own way. Frank Sinatra, right? Pastor Knapp used to always say, I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> I don't go to do it as good as he does. Hallelujah. So he gets, he gets this notion that these people are going to, they're going to revolt on him and they're going to go back. So what does he do? Well, he does what everybody would do if you're going against God, is you just create yourself a new religion. And that's exactly what he did. He really created himself a new religion. How did he do it? Well, he, he, he started seeking advice from his rocket science advisors, you know, these guys that he pulls the side and says, look, we got to do something here or we're going to lose them all. And you're going to lose your position and you're going to lose your position and I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm going to lose all my power. I'm going to lose all my authority. I'm going to lose everything if we don't do something here. So we better think of something fast. And what they thought of was pretty ingenious, pretty bad and very evil, but pretty ingenious. And I say that because they knew that the reason that Solomon lost that kingdom, which they should have thought about that right there, but anyway, the reason he lost it was because of that very thing. They were worshiping idols. And so now he's saying, you know what? They worshiped idols over there in Israel, so maybe they'll just keep on worshiping them over here. So let's go and build a couple of uh, calves, some nice golden calves, and we'll put one over, in, over there in, uh, in Dan and another one over there in Bethel, and, and we'll just uh, we'll, we'll put the, you know, the priests, we'll make priests, which he did. They weren't Levites, they weren't Levitical priests, and that's what's supposed to be. They're supposed to be Levitical priests, but you see, they knew better. They, they actually did leave and go back to Judah. They actually did defect and go back because uh, the Levitical priests weren't, knew that they weren't supposed to worship idols. They knew that. And so they went back to Judah. But uh, everybody else stayed, and the people that stayed weren't Levitical, so he's like, oh, you want to be a priest? Yeah, you could be a priest, you know. Derek, you can be a priest. There's no problem. We'll just put you up in the high places over there, and uh, you can serve, you know, the people. And he tells the people, he says, look, he says, um, uh, he says, asking advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Come here and serve the lot and, and serve God. And they did. And they did. And Jeroboam was one of the most evil because he turned the hearts of God's people to, 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 uh, to idol worship. Do you know there was not one good king? He was the start of it. This is the guy who started. As a matter of fact, if you read the word, and, it, and when they talk about comparing kings and they're using barometers like David, you know, when they did good, he followed. He did the, the right things like his, you know, my servant David did, you know. He was a good king. Uh, then you get the evil ones, which was that whole side. He said, you know, those that served the evil, uh, they served evil just as their father Jeroboam did. He earned that name going through the Bible on the, on the bad king side. And so he was known for that. Not a good thing to be known for. Hallelujah. But this is the scary part, is that he knew. See, Jeroboam knew that those idols were no good. He knew that they were worthless. They were just a, you know, it was just a pile of gold, but they couldn't see, he couldn't hear. He knew that. And he knew that because he didn't care. He didn't care about what God thought. He cared about what he wanted. This was Jeroboam's plan. Remember, this is, uh, you know, making God laugh because he's doing his own plan. And so he does his own plan, what he wants. And he's got, he, he's, he's more for the power, the status, the wealth, and all that he could buy. And what good is it to gain the world than to lose your soul, right? But this is what he did. 
And so if you look even today, we still have his, what he did back then is what's still being done today. As a matter of fact, it's in 2 Timothy 3, 3 through 5, it says people who are without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, having have nothing to do with them. That's what Paul was saying, to have nothing to do with those kind of people. And that's exactly what Jeroboam was. Here's a man who has the... Has a, a, you know, like uh, the, the opportunity of a lifetime, opportunity of a lifetime. If he would have just followed God's instructions, he could have, his, his name would have went down in history just like David did. That's what he was, that's what God was telling him, just like David did. But all of a sudden he sees things happening around him and he's seeing these people going off and he starts getting nervous and he starts saying, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose all of my people. I got to do something. Well, right there. As soon as you start, you got to do something. What did God tell me to do? God told me to sit tight and not worry about it. God told me that this is what was going to happen to me, and this is what's going to happen to me. It is, I love it when people come up to me and, and they'll say, uh, uh, I'll say, oh, did so-and-so, you know, happen, this big, you know, thing this, that was supposed to happen in their life? I say, no, it didn't happen yet, but it's coming. It's coming, and I know it's coming, and I'm 100% sure it's coming. They're so sure that they're going to get it, and they do. How do they know? Because God told them they were going to get it. But so many times when people come against these things and all of a sudden the, 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 the cares of the world get in, get in the way, it's like, oh, we can't, no, no, I'm not going to get that. That's not going to happen to me. You know, it's, uh, there's too many things that are going on in my life. Well, did God tell you you were going to get it? Yeah, he told me, but, you know, oh, so in other words, you know better than God. Oh, the second prophecy Yep, Jeroboam gets another prophecy from the Lord. Only this one isn't so nice. You see, the first time he got a prophecy, that was great. And we even get that today. And that's what I love about that story because it tells us what we get on this side of the cross as well. If we do the things God tells us to do. But now Jeroboam has a sick boy. His, his, uh, his son is sick. And he doesn't know who to turn to. And he's in a, he's in a, he's in a quandary. There's something that he has to do, but he's not sure how he's going to do it because he has a couple of problems. First, he wants to bring this son to that prophet, Ahijai, and he wants to bring it to him because he knows that this man might be able to fix it. You know, he knows he hears from God. He's the one that told him that he was going to get everything he got. But he also knows Ahijai is very upset with him. Uh, doesn't really, you know, appreciate everything that he did because he went so far against God. And so Ahijah is not exactly on his, uh, on his uh, Facebook account, okay? He knows that this guy is bad. And so Ahijah knows he can't really go there, at least knowing him. I can't send somebody so he doesn't know it's me because I don't trust anybody. So he takes his wife. And he says, you got to disguise yourself, and I want you to go see Ahijah. He, he told me everything that I was going to get, and I got everything. And so he's the only one that I trust. And so he sends her out to see him, and uh, he says, you know, disguise yourself. He can't know, he cannot know that it's you. He cannot know that you're my wife. He, he, can't, he can't know that. And so she goes. And as she's going down there, her footsteps are at the door. Now, mind you, Ahijah, the Bible says that he's older. He's much older. And he's also uh, pretty much legally blind, so he can't see anything anyway. So disguising yourself isn't going to, you know, make a difference because he doesn't see you anyway. And so she goes there, and as she's going there, Ahijah gets a message from God. Oh, by the way, uh, Jeroboam's wife is coming over. Uh, her son is sick, he's, uh, and this is what he's, and I, and I have a few words for him that I need you to give him. And so he, she shows up. She's not even in the door. She, he, he hears the footsteps of her out there, and she and he yells out, Ahijah yells out, and he goes, come on in, Jeroboam's wife. So she walks in, and she goes, why the pretense? That's what he says to her, why the pretense? And she explains to him, you know, her husband sent her. And so he says, I have a word for Ahijah. And he says this, he says, you have done more evil than all, you, than all who lived before you. You have made for yourself other gods, idols made of metal. You have aroused my anger and turned your back on me. Because of this, I am going to bring disaster on the house of Jeroboam. I will cut off from Jeroboam every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will burn up the house of 
Jeroboam, as one burns dung until it is all gone, dogs will eat those belonging to Jeroboam who die in the city, and the birds will feed on those who die in the country. The Lord has spoken. And that's exactly what happened. Between Jeroboam and, uh, and uh, a, uh, King Ahab, the, the, the last king, which that guy was actually worse than Jeroboam. He was the only one that was worse than him. But in between there, there were so many wars, and Jer Jeroboam, had, uh, he, he reigned for 22 years, and he had nothing but bad luck. I mean, his, his entire family that God caused, caused confusion in his wars, literally his whole family name was wiped out, and exactly the way God said it was going to happen. Only one person got buried out of his whole family. The rest of them got eaten, just as it said in the city. They got eaten by the dogs in the fields, they, in, the, in the caves, and wherever they went, they got, you know, they got eaten by the birds. And the only one that died, the only one that was buried was his son. And he says, because she, he tells her as she's leaving, she goes, oh, by the way, your son's gonna die this, the moment you hit the city. The moment your foot hits the city, your son is going to die. And as soon as she got home, that is exactly what happened. The son died. But the Lord said that they're going to mourn that child, and that child is going to be buried because he's the only one in Jeroboam's whole history, family history, that is any good, that has any good in him. And so, but he died. And so that ended up his reign, but he was the only one that was buried. That's pretty sad. When we walk away from God, when we reject God and keep on rejecting God, after a while, he just stops listening. Some people, actually most people, uh, get to a point where the word out of their mouth, not one word out of their mouth is, is good. Is everything is negative. You even mention the word God sometimes. You ever talk to people like that? It's like all of a sudden you say, oh, what do you think, uh, you, what, what do you think about Jesus? And I was like, oh, boy, you know, and all of a sudden the eyes go up, you know. Uh, or you get the type that just say, you know, they just come at you like, oh, what is God good? He doesn't do anything for me. To, you know, he's, I've had this in my life. I've had that in my life. And he didn't help me in anything. So what do I need God for? He doesn't do me any good. He doesn't do anything for me. You know, you, you get that. You know, it's just everybody is just angry, especially today. Everybody is so angry with God, with God. It's like you would think that, you know, do you even know that the devil exists? You know, I mean, why is it God that we blame? He's not the one that does that. We're the one that come out from under his covering. And when we come out from under his covering, we allow the enemy to come in because God isn't covering us anymore. When we walk away from God, we reject God and just keep on rejecting. And after a while, he stops listening. That's why Micah 3, 4 tells us, he says, then, then they shall cry to the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time. Micah 3, 4. Praise God. Hallelujah. And so now I want to, uh, I want to bring out uh, Kings 30, 11, 35 through 38 again. I was, I'm going to go through that when God was telling uh, Jeroboam, remember, he was giving him all of these blessings. Well, now I want to go through those blessings, and I want to sh show you what he was rejecting. Because when Jeroboam did everything that he did, which wasn't for the Lord, he was rejecting everything the Lord told him, everything. And so he says in 35, when he says, when God said, I will give you the 10 tribes, he rejected God's power for his life. When God said, however, as for you, I will take you. He rejected God's anointing for his life. When God said, you will rule over all that your heart desires, he, reject, he rejected God's authority for his life. He said, when you will be king over Israel, he rejected God's privilege in his life. When he said, I will be with you, he rejected God's protection for his life. And when God said, I will build you a dynasty enduring as the one built for David, he rejected God's legacy for his life. And lastly, when God said, he will give Israel to you, he rejected God's inheritance for his life. Proverbs 1, 24 through 26 says, Because I called you and you refused, I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention, and you neglected all my counsel and did not want my reproof, I will also laugh at your calamity. Mm. So how to reject God's blessing today? How do we do the, how, do, how are we rejecting God's blessing today? Well, are, we, are you living a life in sin? That will do it. 
When you have unbelief in your heart, if you don't believe what God is telling you and you say, you know, God told me he's going to do this, but I don't believe him, well, then you have unbelief in your heart. That, that, that's, that's, gonna, that's, that's rejecting God. When you're speaking negative over your own life or even your family's life, um, that's, that'll do it. That'll do it. When you're agreeing with the enemy's plan, when the enemy tells you, or when you think your plan is better than God's plan, that's number one. That's what Jeroboam did. He thought his plan was better than God's, and look how it turned out for him. When you're agreeing with the enemy's plan, which he was when he got his advisors together, and he said, what are we going to do? And they built two calves. Well, he was agreeing with his enemy's plans because they're the ones that are behind that. And then he says, <clears throat> uh, another thing that you can do is when you don't want to use your gifts in the house of the Lord and don't want to get involved, that's another thing. You know, God sometimes, get, you know, when people have gifts, God gives talents to us. Some people have talents of music or some people have talents in uh, carpentry or talents in, in, you know, in whatever it is. You know, whatever it is that God, you know, blessed you with and whatever it is that you're really good at, your job. That's why he gives it to us so we can support ourselves. But they don't want to use it for the house of God or they don't want to use it for the Lord because... They don't have time or because something's going on. You know, I get it. But that can be, that can be a block for God's uh, and, and rejecting God's blessing. When you put a limit on what you do to, for him, when you reject new opportunities because of lack of confidence, you know, sometimes in your job, you know, you, all of a sudden there's a promotion that comes up, but you don't want it. Or, you, you know, you want to do something, but you're afraid you can't do it. You know, somebody else is going to do it. You're lacking confidence. If God is, says to you, if God tells you, he says, listen, he goes, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to make you a director of operations. I know you're a manager right now, but I'm making you a director of operations. And then the guy comes in and says, okay, uh, yeah, we, we, want to, we want to move you up to directors of operation. Oh, no, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't do that. Well, why not? Uh, I, I, I don't have you know, the confidence to do that. That's rejecting God's word. He told you that you're going to have it. You're going to have it. He'll give you the wisdom. Amen? So there's little things that we don't even realize that can, that's rejecting God's blessings for us. And so when you think someone else should be getting involved, that's another one too. Um, somebody else. Oh, well, you know what? Uh, no, leave that for them. They should do that. I'm not, I, I can't do that. Leave, let somebody else do that. Uh, when you think uh, someone else should, should be getting involved. When you think that someone else can do it better than you can. But you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Don't be like Jeroboam. Don't reject the blessings that he has for you. So what happens when we don't reject God's plans? Well, that is the exciting part, and that's what I want to talk about towards the end here because this is good stuff right here. What happens when we don't reject God's plans for us when we have power? We have power. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak in Isaiah 40, 29. We have anointing, hallelujah, as for you, at 1 John 2, 27 says, as for you, the anointing which you received from him abides in you. When you have authority, like in 1019, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. When I give you, when, you ha when we have protection from Psalms 34, 7 says, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. We have protection from the Lord. He surrounds us with his, with his angels. When we have privilege, when we have privilege in Philippians 1.29, for you have been granted the privilege for Christ's sake, not only to believe and confidently trust in him, but also to suffer his sake. Oh, hallelujah. We have a privilege when we're speaking for Christ. We have a privilege when we're going out there and talking for the Lord. Legacy, we have legacy for even... Hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Hallelujah. Praise God. First Peter 2 1 says that's following Christ's example. That's what that is. That's following Christ's example when we're when we're when we're doing these things and when we when we're filled with this. And so he leaves the legacy of forgiveness. He leaves a legacy of salvation and kindness and sincere humbleness and perfect love inheritance. We have inheritance in 1 Peter 1, 3, 5. Praise be to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy. He has given us new birth into living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and an inheritance. 
an inheritance that can never perish or spoil or fade. Hallelujah. And so those are the good things that we have in those. He, those were all rejected by Jeroboam. Those are rejected by people that don't want to move into the if factor and do what we're supposed to do and to understand and read the word. That's why it's so important that we get into the word because it tells us who we are. It tells us how to do it. Oh, hallelujah. And so now I want to come back to my key verse. There is a judge for you who rejects me and does not accept my words. And the very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. You know, Jesus' words, he's, he tells us the truth. When Jesus came here, he spoke truth. When we read the word, he, sp he speaks truth. And he spoke a certain way. He spoke in certain parables, but he spoke the truth. And by speaking the truth, because he spoke that to us, we are now to understand and know the truth. And if we know the truth, I mean, you know, we know it'll set you free. But if we know the truth, when we go, when, uh, when the time comes to be judged, and we will be judged, we're going to be judged not only by what we know, but what we heard. And our very words, well, you know what, that's not for me. Psh, you're judged on that. And it's not Jesus. Jesus didn't come to judge or condemn the world. He came to save the world. He said, that's the Father's job. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. God is so good. Amen. 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 Then Jesus Christ, I want to read uh, Luke 12, 44 through uh, 49. It says, then Jesus cried out, whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light so that no one believes, so that one, no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. If anyone hears my words but, keep, but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I do not come to judge the world, but to save the world. And then 48, there is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. And the very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that this command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Hallelujah. And so I just end with this, church. God has a plan for you. And if you're going to be in God's plan... We have to start not only reading the word. I mean, we say this a hundred times, and I know that. But if we read the word, he gives the instructions for us to live the life that we have. If God created the world, as I said earlier, if God created it, then God isn't the author of it. Then God knows how to run it, and he knows how to He created you. He created me. And if he's telling us how to live our lives, if he's showing us what we need to do, and all he says, by the way, is if you follow these things, you're going to be blessed. You're going, you know, yeah, you're going to come across some trials. There's going to be things that come, but they're only coming against. Those trials that come against you are only to strengthen you. Because you see, God said you're going to get through it. So if we just listen to what God tells us to do and we do it, if we do it, then we will come out on the other side in victory. And that's what I want you to know. If something happens, and, and let it go across your mind. I, I said, uh, I think it was last week, or I said on a Wednesday night, I was saying, you know, I, I, when, you go to this, when you go to this grocery store, and you see the little, you know, uh, you, you, we go out to check out, and then the thing comes up, and it says that you want to round it up to the nearest dollar, to the, no, to the highest dollar, to uh, feed the homeless. So I say yes. But I only say yes because that's what Jesus would do, right? Jesus wants to feed the homeless, so he would say yes. You know, if you purchase something at the, at the Home Depot and, and you realize that it, the price was wrong or something, you make sure you correct it. You say, hey, I made a mistake here. We need to fix this. I need to pay you more money. You know, we have to do that. If we did that, if everybody did said yes to what God wants us to say yes to, it would be a whole different world. If I went to the, the I had a concrete patio done. And I remember when I had that thing done, let's just say, I mean, it was beautiful. It actually came out great. But the thing is, let's just pretend, for example, it didn't. And I said, listen, I'm not paying you the last $5,000 because I don't like the way the job is. And, and he's just going to fight, right? He's, he's too, there's going to be two negatives here because he's going to fight and say, oh, no, it's fine and whatever, right? And so we're going to go back and forth on it. But if there's one positive in the thing, the positive could be either me or the positive could be him. If I say, you know what? Don't worry about it. I don't like the way it is. It's not really done right, but I'm paying you because I told you I was going to pay you. So here, here you go. I, I'm paying you. 
Now, if he's hearing from God, too, if we have two positives, right, he's going to say, you know what, I, I really did a bad job here, and so I'm not even going to hold you accountable for the last five. You can just keep it. You see how it can go one way or the other? Usually, it's gonna, usually it goes two ways, and they're both negative. But if you do it in a positive, you watch how it changes your life. Amen? Praise God. God bless you.